Good evening. Welcome to Hanford Live. Uh, this is the second online conversation uh, concerning the ongoing cleanup at the Hanford site in central Washington. Uh, the first was held in 2017 and a couple other um, events that have uh, kind of alternated with uh, Hanford Live um, is the Hanford Regional uh, Dialogue. One of those were held a year ago, uh, a year ago this fall, and the second one was, was held recently in June. And this really reflects uh, the management and regulatory agency's commitment to provide different opportunities for people uh, to be engaged in the conversation around Hanford and people that are um, affected by and interested in the cleanup activities there. My name is Susan Heyman, and I am the facilitator host for this evening. I'm a neutral third party. Uh, I don't work for any of the agencies uh, that you will be hearing from this evening. And my job really uh, is to keep the meeting on time, to keep the meeting on track, uh, to try to get to as many questions as possible that you have either submitted in advance or are going to be submitting tonight. But probably most importantly, my job is to try to have an engaging conversation with the panelists in an effort to try to get uh, some good conversation and, and uh, get some responses to the questions that you have been asking about. Um, I'm joined by representatives from the three agencies that are referred to as the Tri-Party Agreement Agencies, and you'll hear us talking about them tonight, and they'll talk about themselves as the TPA agencies. Um, and they are committed to work together uh, on the Hanford Cleanup Mission. And joining them to represent a stakeholder's perspective is the chair of the Hanford Advisory Board, and I'll be introducing the panelists here shortly, and they will say a little bit more about themselves. So what are we here to do tonight? So number one, this is a, a dialogue, this is a public forum uh, between the TP agency leadership and you, the public. It's to provide an opportunity for the TPA agencies to provide you some information regarding their perspective of Hanford's past, uh, current, and future uh, cleanup activities. And it's to provide the public an opportunity, you, to ask questions, express your concerns, and learn about the priorities and current activities related to the Hanford site cleanup mission. So a really important part of the success for this evening is your engagement, your questions, getting them into us so that I'm able to then uh, bring them before the panelists. So just so that you know how it's gonna go this evening, I'm gonna finish up these remarks here uh, very quickly. And then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to make a brief presentation. And they all have some slides to accompany those. And then we're going to get to your questions and comments. And just so that you know how that works, we have a few that have been submitted in advance. Uh, we're expecting to get, get a number of them uh, submitted during this presentation tonight. And in fact, you can do that um, through the question box that's on the Vimeo uh, feed that you're uh, viewing this on. Or you can submit questions to um, Hanford Live, gosh, had that right in front of me here. Here we go, hanfordlive at rl.gov. So you can send it email or you can submit it through the question box. So either way, be sure that we get your questions uh, and that will be helpful. We have folks that are helping me to compile those questions and you'll see or possibly see people bringing questions up to me during the course of uh, the panel this evening. Um, I want you to know that if you uh, submit a really lengthy question with a lot of context, we may edit that. Uh, just so that we can get more questions in. And because we're focused here this evening trying to get uh, some general conversation around Hanford and, and possibly involve people who are less experienced or, or maybe know a little bit less about Hanford, um, I'm going to tend to prioritize the questions that are broader in nature or may have a wider appeal. I know there are some of you watching tonight that are very technical and have very technical questions. We'll try to get to those, but there may be some of those that are more suitable for other conversations, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. I think the other thing I want to be sure that you know is that, as I would if I were facilitating a meeting in person, I'm going to encourage you to submit questions that are um, uh, constructive and, and uh, courteous, and that's how I will be reading the questions as they come to me, so thank you for that. Uh, I may ask a question of more than one of the panelists, and the panelists are certainly welcome to add on to others' questions. And in the event that a question is being answered, and it feels to me that maybe um, I misrepresented the question somehow, or, or that we maybe didn't get to all of the question, I may restate a part of that question uh, for the panelists. 
We're going to get to as many questions as we can by 8.50 p.m. tonight, and then we're going to invite the panelists to make some closing remarks, and then we'll be done by 9 o'clock. Uh, one of the things you'll see, and I hope you stay with us to the end, is we're going to have a link to an evaluation form, and we really, really would appreciate it if you would go to that link and if you would evaluate how this worked for you tonight. Um, the tri-party agencies are very interested in how, you, how this worked for you and would love to get your feedback. So we'll be mentioning that um, as we get to the evening, uh, later on this evening. Uh, this is going to be recorded tonight and at Hanford.gov. Uh, that's the spot that you can go to later, probably after a week or so, uh, we're expecting uh, this will be posted. So if you would like to view it again, or if you had somebody that you're acquainted with that didn't get a chance to watch this live, uh, you can direct them to that. Uh, there will not be a written summary provided tonight, but we will have the recording of the entire uh, broadcast. So I think with that, oh, one other thing I should mention. When you submit a comment and when I read them, if you include your name, I will actually read your name. So I'll say, you know, Joe Smith submitted this question. Uh, if you would like or prefer that your name is not read, you can submit questions anonymously or you can ask that I not read your name. So questions that are anonymous or, or questions that have names, either way, um, we'll get to those questions. I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panelists. I'm excited to do this and uh, we'll get going here. So first, uh, on, on my left is Brian Vance. Brian is with the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, he is the Office of River Protection and Richland Operations Office Manager. And you'll often hear the Office of River Protection uh, as ORP and the Richland Operations Office as RL. But Brian is the manager of both of those offices. In his role as the Hanford Site Manager, Brian is responsible for the safe and environmentally acceptable cleanup of the 580 square mile Hanford site. Brian has over 30 years of experience in the nuclear industry, including three years at Hanford. And we're glad you're here tonight, Brian. Uh, next to Brian is Ben Harp. Ben is the ORP deputy manager. And in his role, Ben is responsible for the safe storage, retrieval, treatment, and disposal of Hanford's 53 million gallons of chemical and radioactive waste. Ben has 28 years of experience at Hanford, including three years in his current position. And Ben, again, we welcome you tonight. Uh, seated next to Ben is Joe Franco. Joe is the deputy manager for the Richland's operations office. And in his role, he is responsible for oversight of daily operations, program planning, project execution, budgeting compliance with the tri-party agreement and management of the Hanford site. Joe has 13 years of experience at Hanford, including one year in his current position. Again, Joe, thank you. Uh, Alex Smith uh, manages the state of Washington's nuclear waste program with the Washington State Department of Ecology. As the program manager, Alex guides the state's regulatory oversight of the Hanford cleanup, making sure that cleanup activities meet the requirements of state and federal law. Formerly with the State Attorney General's Office and the Ports of Seattle and Olympia, Alex has been in her position for more than three years. Alex, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Dave Enan, next to Alex, is the Hanford Program Manager for the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Uh, in his role as the EPA Program Manager, Dave represents one of the three agencies, one of the tri-party agreement agencies that sets cleanup plans and deadlines for Hanford under the legally binding tri-party agreement. Dave has held his current position for two years. He's worked at Hanford um, for 28 years as a remedial project manager and so just celebrated his 30th anniversary. So thank you, Dave, for joining us. And then rounding out the panel, uh, Susan Leckband, who is the chair of the Hanford Advisory Board. Susan has served on the, on the Hanford Advisory Board for 23 years and has been in a chair or vice chair position for 18 of those years at different times. Uh, as a Tri-City resident, she's been curious and active in Hanford cleanup and spent her career working in a variety of positions at the Hanford site and in retirement, and she continues to serve on the Hanford Advisory Board. So thank you, Susan. So again, thank you very much, all you panelists, for uh, giving up your time this evening and, and uh, engaging in this conversation with the public about Hanford. So I think with that, um, it's time for me to go ahead and turn this over to Brian Vance. Uh, Brian will be speaking for the Department of Energy. Uh, so Brian, please. Thank you, Susan. Well, it's really great to be here tonight to, to provide the opportunity for us to talk about the Hanford site, 
Um, and we've really started to talk more broadly about the site and the historical perspective I think is important um, to really frame the, the work that has gone on here in the past and the work that we have in front of us uh, going forward in the future. So I'm um, excited to be here to talk about that today. Next slide, please. Um, you can look at the, the, the site. This is a little bit of the life cycle and the historical overview. And we'll decompose this during the, the remarks tonight. But the Hanford site really is anchored in, the in a national security mission, which started uh, with the Manhattan Project. And this is actually the 75th anniversary of the B reactor and the T plant uh, that when they began operations as part of the Manhattan Project and really started a national security mission that lasted over four decades at the Hanford site um, to ensure that the country uh, was safe and, and secure during the Cold War period uh, through 1989. In 1999, the, 1989 we, we, we transitioned the site from the national security mission to an environmental cleanup mission. Um, and I think if you think about the history of the site overall, um, this has been one of the great public works, certainly of the last century, and I look at the cleanup effort that we have going on today as a great public works of the current century. Um, and I'll talk more about the life cycle as we go. So please, next slide. The history of the Hanford site, again, anchored in the National Security Mission, um, it was really a tremendous technical, technological um, and innovation period for the site and for the nation, and really was the birth of the nuclear industry. And if you look just quickly at the history, um, there were actually nine reactors operating at the site during the National Security Mission. They, there were nine or 20 million uh, rods or metal rods of uranium fuel that were prepared and delivered for, for, for irradiation. 110,000 tons of fuel processed through five different processing uh, uh, approaches to, to extract the uranium. Uh, delivery of 74 tons, which was 66% of the nation's plutonium, um, and left 177 underground tanks with uh, about 53 million gallons of waste um, for, uh, for our mission during the environmental cleanup. Um, but again, an important period of time in our nation, an important national security mission, all executed at the Hanford site. Um, and the mission through 1989 was really to set the stage, it has set the stage for our cleanup mission beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you look at the, the site today, um, as mentioned, 580 square miles, um, currently two offices, uh, two Department of Energy offices overseeing the cleanup, the Richland Operations Office and the Office of River Protection, which Susan described and Joe and Ben will um, provide more detail as we go into the um, question and answer period. 350 federal employees are on board today, uh, 9,000 employees uh, involved in the cleanup mission uh, across four different contractors, uh, four different prime contractors. And the overall strategy um, has really been to clean up along the river and move towards the central plateau where we build the infrastructure to support the, the tank waste cleanup mission um, as we look forward. The effort really is underpinned by our focus on the safety for the workforce, the safety of the public, and the safety of the environment. And we remain committed to that um, as we move forward in the challenging mission and uniquely challenging mission that the cleanup represents. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things that I think we don't often do a very good job of, of is talking about the amount of cleanup that has been accomplished in the last 30 years. And so I'll, I'll go through a period of slides that shows sort of the before and after picture of the reactor, the reactors along the river and some of the other facilities. But I, I hope you'll look at the number of of adjoining facilities, the infrastructure um, that has to that was in place during the operations of each of those reactors, and see to see what it looks like now to get some perspective on the overall cleanup that's been accomplished so far. So if you'll click the first slide, that was the F reactor area before and after, and you can see the year that's captured in this slide, the period of time between that picture and the and the the, the cleanup to the point where you can see what's left is that reactor and in interim safe storage. Uh, next slide, please. N reactor. Uh, next slide. You can see the, the transition there. It's probably one more. Um, next slide, please. The N reactor area, or I'm sorry, D and DR. Go ahead, hit. So you can see the cleanup effort there. Uh, next slide. H reactor. Click again. And so that those that, those are some examples of, of the visible 
cleanup that's occurred along the, the river corridor with the reactors. And now we'll, we'll show the, some, some uh, results of the pump and treat effort because there has been contamination into the ground and in, in cases into the groundwater. And so we have five active pump and treat uh, facilities on the site, all working to remove the, the water um, and the contaminants from the soil, withdraw those contaminants, and then put the water back into the, uh, into the ground. You can see the, the first example of the, the plumes being shrunk and pulled away from the river, and that's for hexavalent chromium uh, in the H area. And then you can see from 2008 again, the reduction in those plumes. And, and the pump and treat is a, is a critical part of our overall effort, again, for a layered defense to protect the environment and continue the cleanup effort to reduce the risk to the river and the public as we move forward. Uh, next slide is the uh, K reactors. And these, these two reactors are the last two along the river that we have to, to clean up. And th what you see now in 2019 is a, a significant amount of the infrastructure has already been reduced. Um, we just completed a sludge removal project, which took sludge uh, uh, in containers uh, from adjacent near the river and placed them in the central plateau. And that project was completed this year um, in September, and that set the stage for us now to move forward in, in placing the last two reactors and putting them in interim safe storage over the next several years. So the, the after picture of, of the K Basin will look very similar to the after pictures of the other reactors that you've already seen. Go to the next slide. This is the 300 area. The 300 area uh, was the area where the fuel was produced um, for the reactors that were operating along the river uh, to, to irradiate the fuel and extract the plutonium in the central plateau. Um, you can see from 19, 1970 to 2015, and if you anchored on that one building in the lower right portion with, the, with the, the stack, you can see north of that, everything else has been, been removed from that, from that area. So another phenomenal cleanup effort. And we actually have started putting historical markers out on the site to highlight where cleanup has been accomplished because often when you drive by cleanup today, it looks like the rest of the site and we forget how much work and effort was put into the actual cleanup effort that's been completed there. Uh, the next slide is really an overview, but a couple things to highlight. And this is again, the highlight of the first 30 years of our cleanup. Um, six of the nine reactors have been placed in interim safe storage. One is a national park. And the last one is, the last two will be uh, the K Basin and we'll be working on those over the next several years. Um, almost 900 facilities demolished, over 1,300 waste sites remediated, and over 22 billion gallons of groundwater treated um, to date. And this year alone, we treated over 2 billion gallons of groundwater. So that's what the cleanup effort has, has done to date, and that's what we're doing today. Um, next slide. As we look to the future, there's some projects that I know what people are interested in, we, we have talked about for a number of years. The first is the plutonium finishing plant. Um, if, you, if you see the, the, the progress has been progressed um, well to this year, and just today, we started the final phase of demolition on the plutonium finishing plant that, will, that we're driving to a final disposition with a slab on grade target early next calendar year. Um, that, that work is now being done very safely, effectively, and efficiently with a workforce that's working together very, very well to progress a challenging mission. Uh, next slide is the tank waste treatment um, operations that will be tied to direct feed low activity waste. In the, in the background, you can see the waste treatment plant, and in the foreground, you can see the tank farms um, that are, that are and, and really what we're talking about is the AP farm, which is near the sign that says tank sites easy to removal. Uh, we're preparing to deliver the waste treatment, uh, the, low, the low activity waste treatment in 2022, and the, the project is going very well. The tank side season removal uh, system and the equipment is well into fabrication. We expect that to have that delivered in December, and we'll be doing local testing here this year. Um, and so, and the work in the AP106 tank, uh, which is the feed tank to the waste treatment plant, is well underway as well. If you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the waste treatment plant itself. The left is an overview, and you can see the facilities that are actually completed with the, with the roofs on them, and we're now actually working on the grading to start the paving and the final touches on the facility itself to, to get it prepared for operation. Upper right, you can see some of the large vessels um, that, are, that have been placed in the plant, and lower right is the effluent management facility um, that is really the final phase of construction on the site, really the only active construction left on the site. Um, and it's, it's progressing very well and will be completed next year. The 
the control room at the waste treatment plant. We've had a, a ribbon cutting ceremony recently. It's operating 24 hours, seven days a week right now. Um, and we have the lab op occupancy permit for the lab that's on the site, one of the facilities you see there. Um, the last critical component was delivered in October. 68% uh, of the commissioning techs, the people that will operate the plant, are now hired and going through their training. And 64% of the operational procedures are complete as we continue to make our preparations for the operation of the facility. Uh, next slide. A view over the next five years. Um, we're entering a period of dynamic change. We have contract transitions that will be occurring over the next several months for all of the contractors on the site with the, expect, with the exception of the waste treatment plant contractor. Um, and we're preparing for operations of direct feed low activity waste, which are really, it's a fundamental change in the operational posture at the site that we're preparing to execute. Um, it's not a mistake that we put tank waste treatment operations and direct feed low activity waste in capital letters and made it bit larger than the rest of the, the work across the site because that's our focus, that's our priority. And it's truly a site-wide machine. Both of the Department of Energy offices and all of the, all the contractors on the site have to work together and are working together to deliver the waste treatment capability that's re represented by direct feed low activity waste. But we also have other projects around the site that will continue. Tank waste retrievals um, in the Central Plateau will start retrieving AX102 uh, again this weekend to continue the progress at that tank. It's about 67% retrieved at this point. We have cesium and strontium capsules, almost 2,000 that we're gonna put in safer storage in, um, in the next several years. Uh, the out of a basin, dry storage where it's more stable and for the longer term. Uh, K Basin, as we talked about, continuing the work to prepare for the last two reactors to be cocooned. Um, the groundwater treatment, we have the five facilities. That's an important part of our work and we'll continue that work. Plutonium finishing plant, as I mentioned, and some other risk reduction activities is there. And the 324 building, which is a building um, in the 300 area, the last building in the 300 area that's part of the demolition um, for the cleanup effort there. Um, and again, we have infrastructure and reliability. Um, projects that we have across the site will continue with our tank integrity program, which are very robust to ensure that the tanks that are holding the waste remain sound as we prepare for tank waste treatment and execute tank waste treatment. Um, risk reduction and acceleration opportunities. We're always looking for opportunities where new technology or new approaches are made available so we can overall shorten the overall mission at the site to continue the cleanup. Our focus areas as a Department of Energy are really four. Uh, first, transition to operations. Um, I can't stress enough, we're going from a construction and demolition type of a site posture to an operating posture on the site, which is a significant change. Um, my background's in the Navy. I liken it to taking a, refuel a ship out of refueling overall and taking it sea for to the first time. And the change in the crew that's gotta take, take place to support that is the change we face across the 9,000 people at the site. Um, we're also focused on being a fair and demanding customer to ensure that we can establish the conditions so world-class cu customers can deliver world-class performance um, to, to help us in execution of this work across the site uh, to make sure that we can be successful. We're gonna continue to work to strengthen our stakeholder relationships, um, to set the conditions around the site so we can be successful as a team in delivering the, the challenging mission that we have in front of us. And lastly, the last slide, um, we want to be a high-performing team. What you see on the slide today is a picture on the 1st of October um, of the DOE team, from the secretary uh, down through Undersecretary Paul DeBar, uh, through Senior Advisor Ike White, and then the DOE team here at Hanford, all committed to effectively um, executing this mission. Um, we want to work with our contractors, we want to work with our regulators, we want to work with all of our stakeholders to set the conditions that we can all be successful um, in, in treating, in, 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 in executing this challenging cleanup work and deliver the site um, safely, efficiently, and effectively. Um, and I'll, leave, I'll lastly, before I turn it over to the next speaker, I just wanna leave with a sense of optimism. We, have, we are making great progress across the site and a number of great projects. Um, there are gonna be challenges. There are challenges we face every day. We'll continue to work together to effectively do our mission. And I think because of the success of the Hanford site, over the last 75 years facing similar challenges, I today am optimistic about what we face together and working together what we can accomplish. Thank you very much, Susan. I look forward to the rest of the evening. Thanks, Brian, and thanks for
providing that uh, extra background on Hanford as well. Alex, let's go to you for the state regulator's perspective, please. Sure, um, and Alex Smith, I'm glad to be here to talk about Hanford tonight. Uh, I'm uh, Actually, next slide, please. So I was gonna talk a little bit about Ecology's regulatory role at Hanford, what we do, uh, the tri-party agreement, the current work Ecology is engaged in, and then a consent decree that we have with the Department of Energy related to the tank waste mission. Next slide. So what is our role at Hanford? Uh, so we are authorized to implement a number of federal environmental laws at Hanford, and those include the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which, um, or otherwise known as RICRA, the acronym. And that one really has to do with the safe management, storage, treatment, and disposal of hazardous wastes, and also what's known as mixed waste, which is hazardous waste mixed with radioactive materials. And that is um, exactly what is in the, the um, 150, 147 uh, tanks, single shell tanks at Hanford, um, and so that is something we regulate under RICRA. Uh, we also implement some things under the Federal Superfund Law, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA, at specified sites. So we act as a lead agency up until the time it, uh, a, a, a final decision is needed, and then EPA makes the final decision. We essentially step in EPA's role walk all the way up to the final decision, hand it off to EPA, and EPA is responsible for the final decision on those sites. Next slide. So the tri-party agreement. Um, the Federal Facilities Compliance Act is a federal act that was enacted in, in 1992, and it did two important things. The first is it said all federal agencies need to comply with um, RICRA, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, to the same extent as any private party or private company needs to. But then it also said very specifically for Department of Energy Wastes um, that you need to have a site treatment plan, that there needs to be a plan for how legacy wastes that are stored at DOE sites across the country would be treated um, and disposed of. And it requires an enforceable plan and a schedule for the treatment and disposal of um, that mixed waste, the waste that's chemical waste mixed with radioactivity. So the tri-party agreement is Hanford's site treatment plan under the Federal Facilities Compliance Act, and it also serves as a CERCLA compliance order. Um, it includes an action plan that has um, a long list of milestones for the completion of, of specific cleanup tasks on the way to final cleanup at the site. Milestones, though, can be moved, um, and they've been moved out historically to ad address funding and other challenges. Next slide. So Resource Conservation Recovery Act, what are we working on currently? Um, you heard Brian Vance talk about uh, the direct feed low activity waste treatment that is coming online hopefully in a year or two. So currently we are working on seven permits to support those facilities and the operations because they are treatment storage and disposal facilities that are regulated under RICRA, then we have permitting responsibilities for the construction of those facilities and also the operation of them. So we're working on operating permits for low activity waste treatment and some of the support facilities. And also we're working on a permit for the disposal site for the treated waste, which will be, um, it'll be vitrified waste turned into glass logs put into metal canisters. And so we're permitting the disposal site for those canisters. Uh, we're also working on some permits related to the movement of the cesium and strontium capsules to dry storage. Again, Brian mentioned this, this is taking the very radioactive uh, cesium and strontium capsules that have been stored in a basin for decades. Um, the basin is now starting to um, de uh, degrade a little because of all the radioactivity, and so the safest thing to do is to move them to dry storage. So we're working with the department on permits for that dry storage facility um, and the movement of those capsules to dry storage. Uh, we also have a compliance role, and so we do ongoing inspections. We have regular schedules of inspections of Hanford facilities. There are um, something in the neighborhood of 37 groups of waste treatment units that need to be inspected periodically, and uh, so we have com a compliance team that works on that on a regular basis. And then we're also working on something called coordinated closure, where we're trying to, um, for areas where there are two different um, uh, legal um, mechanisms or legal acts that apply, so RICRA and CERCLA say apply to a particular uh, cleanup area. We're trying to make sure we've got processes so you only need one set of cleanup documents and you're only doing one cleanup activity. You don't have to have two separate sets of documents for those two different regulatory authorities. And then on CERCLA, on, we're working in particular on one site, 200 BP5 PO1. Um, we're working on a set of documents for that and there will be a public involvement opportunity for that in early 2020. Next slide. 
This is just to give um, a visual depiction. Um, on the bottom of that is all the various units that we regulate under uh, RICRA at the site. There's one, it's considered, the entire site is considered to be one RICRA facility, and these are units within the, the site-wide permit. And this is just a graphic depiction of the different work we've been doing on permit modifications for all those different units um, in the past year. Next slide. So consent decree, um, Ecology and the Department of Energy also have a consent decree in addition to the tri-party agreement. We entered into that in 2010 to address certain aspects of the tank waste mission that um, were getting delayed repeatedly. And it's the high level waste treatment um, plant and then the pretreatment facility and then some single shell tank retrievals as well. The consent decree was then amended in 2016 um, and it did push the dates out for the high level waste vitrification and pretreatment facilities out to the 2033 and 2036 time period. Um, recently, the Department of Energy notified the state that some of those deadlines are at serious risk of being missed. Um, and so the eco ecology and energy have uh, agreed to begin working towards holistic negotiations to look at how do we um, modify those dates and look realistically at what it will take to complete those facilities and get to the high level waste treatment mission at Hanford. Next slide. I think that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, let's go ahead now and turn to Dave. Uh, and Dave, if you'd provide us the federal uh, regular, regulator perspective, please. Thank you, Susan. Um, and I'd like to also thank my colleagues here at the table and the people who are making this, process, this meeting possible. And of course, first and foremost, those of you who are participating online. Um, so quite simply, EPA's role at Hanford is to ensure that cleanups at Hanford are protective of human health and the environment. That's, that's kind of EPA's mantra and we do that here just like we do everywhere else. Um, one aspect of that that's important to us is that we need to ensure, we want to ensure that the public is involved in the decision making process. Not only is that the right thing to do, it's also required by, by the federal regulations. And you know, Alex has kind of touched on, on those and these are the two major ones that EPA is involved in, um, but mo the, or that affect the cleanup. Um, as Alex said, the state implements the, the state dangerous waste program in lieu of the federal program. And we've got the, the CERCLA, also known as Superfund. Um, Superfund as a law said, gave the president lots of authority. Well. The president signed an executive order delegating that authority to the federal agencies that would implement it, um, mostly obviously to the EPA, but for federal facilities like the Department of Energy's Hanford site, the, the lead agency role goes to the Department of Energy. Um, yeah. And one of the other requirements of that act is that for cleanups, you need to enter into a federal facility agreement. And the TPA is one is that. Um, we call it the Tri-Party Agreement or TPA because Hanford Federal Facility Agreement and Consent Order, it just takes too long. It was signed in 1989, so it's 30 years ago last May. Um, the as I said before, DOE is the lead agency for the cleanup. It's their responsibility to make it happen. And our responsibility is to provide oversight of the, the circle of cleanups. And as Alex also mentioned, we, we divided, they do some of the, the lead up into the decision. Um, circular decisions require a joint, it's either a joint decision or EPA makes it in the end if there's a dispute. Um, next. And then I'm going to finish off with, with kind of EPA's priorities. Um, you know, we've, this whole cleanup has been focused primarily along the, the Columbia River and, and bringing things in to get things away from the river. The river, is, as, as I assume we all know, is a very important regional resource. 
um, and the, the, it's the, kind of the site boundary. And so it's virtually, as Brian showed you, lots of really telling pictures that show just how much has actually been accomplished. Um, yet to be, there's just a few things left. We've got a few decisions. We've got a public comment period going on now in 100 BC. Um, there's the K basins, we're, that's where we're overseeing that work, the 324 building, and we've the groundwater restoration both along the, the river and on the central plateau. Also on the central plateau is the environmental restoration disposal facility where all of the cleanup waste from Hanford gets put. And so we're looking at moving on to, to characterization decisions and cleanup of the central plateau and these priorities are all reflected in schedules and milestones and deadlines for the cleanup and that become part of the tri-party agreement. Thank you. All right, thank you Dave. All right, Susan Lechband, we would appreciate your uh, local perspective uh, from the Hanford Advisory Board. Thank you all for joining us. The Hanford Advisory Board is really a regional board um, and it is comprised of 32 seats representing many different organizations including tribal nations as well as local governments, the public, workers. This is our 25th year. In 1994 in February the board held its first meeting. Since then there has been an incredibly strong commitment to the consensus process. All of these varying voices have committed to learn about Hanford, have committed also to reach consensus to provide that public perspective based on values. In 300, more than 300 times, we have provided consensus advice as well as white papers and, and daily conversations with the agencies. And we've appreciated the ability to do that. We want them to succeed. We want the site to be cleaned up as best it can be safely so that we can protect generations in the future and enable them to be safe around the Hanford site. We've been following the plutonium finishing plant and it's, we're thankful that it's in its final days of demolition. It is arguably one of the most contaminated sites in the entire EM complex. Next slide. Priorities, our first priority is always protect the Columbia River. We use that as the lens in which we look at and learn about Hanford cleanup. We'd like to follow those decisions to ensure that those decisions would ensure that the Columbia River is safe. We are also very supportive of direct feed low activity processing by 2022-2023. The tank waste needs to come out, it needs to be processed and put in a safe configuration ready for disposal. Funding increases are always needed to meet the milestones in the tri-party agreement. Every year we try to provide the agencies, the Department of Energy, with the priorities so that they have an idea of how the board and the board members feel about, depending on the amount of money they are provided, that the right work gets done. We are also concerned about an activity that's going on right now in which the reinterpretation of high-level waste may affect some cleanup at Hanford. We're not sure. It's another thing that we're learning about. We're concerned that, that it may end up with more waste on the Hanford site, but that's to come and we continue to learn about it. As Brian said, there are major contracts to be awarded. There's always a huge transition time when major contracts are awarded, so we want to help the agencies as much as possible understand and make those transitions successful without any cleanup delay. Finally, transparency. The board itself, all of our meetings are open to the public. We encourage the public to attend when they can. At the major board meetings, there is always an opportunity for the public to comment. And we really enjoy it when the public comes. We are there, we are committed to providing the agencies with the soundest advice that we can and it's well informed. We, we learn and then we speak. 
next page, you can get involved. This is one great opportunity. I'm, I'm grateful to be, have the opportunity to share this with you. The Hanford Advisory Board is only one element of public engagement. There are public involvement opportunities. There's speakers bureau program that the Department of Energy and the agencies have. You can, there are public tours. Uh, they're really interesting and, and, you know, it's an opportunity for you to see what has happened out on site. If you go to www.hanford.gov, there's all kinds of information. If you click on outreach, there's a drop down menu that shows you the Hanford Advisory Board as well as other opportunities for outreach. All of our advice, all of the meeting minutes are all recorded there open to the public. You can also follow all the progress being made on social media, Facebook, Twitter, all of the agencies have accounts with those and uh, I believe that you can connect with any of them if you have questions. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Susan, and thank you uh, for the presenters. Appreciate you providing a good foundation. And I am excited to say that I have a bunch of questions uh, that we have been receiving here. So thank you, uh, folks, for sending those questions in. And just a reminder, um, on your live stream feed there, your Vimeo feed, there is a question box. And you have a character limit there, but um, a brief, succinct question, uh, that's a great place to submit it to us. You can also send questions to uh, HanfordLive.gov, or pardon me, HanfordLive at RL.gov. Uh, and then uh, there are some uh, Facebook uh, feeds that are going on as well. So looking forward to getting more of your questions. S and I should also mention that some of you have sent in like multi-part questions and in, in an effort to try to get around to as many people as possible. You may hear me just hit one of your questions. Uh, if I can come back to a follow-up question or a second question that you've asked, I will certainly do that. But I do want to get around to as many people um, as possible. Uh, the other thing I'm trying to do here is I have these questions here and I'm trying to kind of package them a little bit so that maybe we ask a few questions around certain topics. So if we, if we do spend some time and we're going to actually start with some cleanup uh, progress questions, uh, if, we, if we do that, then um, we may hit another topic following that, but that doesn't prevent us from coming back if you have uh, additional questions around cleanup. So uh, don't hesitate to submit a question. Uh, thinking that, well, we've already talked about that, so we won't go back to that. So please do that. So the first question, uh, is, so I think all of the presenters talked about the cleanup that's going on at Hanford right now, and, and some of you had like a five-year window or, or even longer. So my question uh, for, for all of the managers here, and I'd also be interested to hear what uh, the HABS perspective is, so if those are all of the, the interesting cleanup or important cleanup that you want to do over time, what would you say are the like really key cleanup projects for this year? Brian, would you like yeah, to start? Yeah, I'll be happy to start. Um, you know, what, when we think about where we are with direct feed low activity wastes, um, there are a number of projects supporting that effort that are critical for us to make progress on. The waste treatment plant project is continuing through startup and commissioning. Um, the tank farm projects to support direct feed low activity waste are proceeding uh, to support the timeline. We have infrastructure projects that are also associated with direct feed low activity waste. So all of those projects through a much like a federated project plan are all having to be progressed to ensure that they all come together at the right time uh, to support that mission. Um, Joe, you might want to talk about 324 building because that's another one that I think is close to town and has some interesting aspects to it that are important to explore. Yep, so for uh, this next physical year of 2020 that we're in right now, one of the key items is our 324 building in the 300 area. As we're preparing uh, one of the hot cells there for us to go in and remove the floor and um, also to start the excavation underneath the floor for uh, removal of some contaminated waste on, on the uh, soils underneath that, that facility. So that, all that preparation work and actually cutting through the floor is prepared, is going to be done this year. Uh, we're also doing some stabilization for that facility so that we can cut the floor and dig underneath the building so the building will be stabilized. So that's a big one as well uh, that we have planned for this year. And of course, we talked a lot about the plutonium finishing plant 
as Brian mentioned as well, that's a key milestone that we're all pushing for for the, uh, this calendar year in 2020. Thank you. Alex, from your perspective for this year? I guess I would agree with uh, everything the Department of Energy said. I think as Brian has been emphasizing, uh, Showing progress at the site is very important. It helps sustain uh, interest in the site and helps sustain congressional funding and interest in funding the site. And so I think making significant progress on direct feedlot activity waste facilities and getting us that much closer to actually treating some of the tank waste, as well as finishing the plutonium finishing plant um, demolition, that was a project that I think has been a, a long time coming. Um, and then also the 324 building, as uh, Brian alluded to, it's close to Richland and it does have a, a real hot spot of some pretty concerning waste. And so making significant progress on that is also really important. Okay, thank you. Dave, anything to add? Yeah, again, I will. I'll, obviously I agree with, with everything that, that they've all said, but, and I, I kind of want to highlight there, there's a couple of other things like the, there's a, Bit of work to be done still are in the 100 BC area and then the K Basin sludge and finishing that project. Um, there's, and we need to be, be getting some, there's, Brian also just touched on in his presentation the, some of the high risk, uh, like there's a, a, a tank near the plutonium finishing plant. We need to be ready to do something there. Um, and then just making other cleanup decisions in the central plateau to keep making progress and having um, uh, appropriate feed for the, the disposal facility to mix with the debris that we're gonna generate, so. Okay, thanks Dave. Uh, you, you can, and then I'll come back over to Susan. Go ahead, Ben. So Brian mentioned uh, AX102 retrieval. We have consent decree milestones that are in 2021 for retrieving two of those AX tanks. Um, he mentioned that we did 67% of AX102. We'll, we'll be uh, starting up that second tank. So retrievals, getting waste out of those single shell tanks is um, for the consent decree is really important to us. The other thing is we have a capital project for removing cesium and solids out of the waste before it goes to the waste treatment plant, which is called tank side cesium removal. And that um, capital project's moving along well, and that unit will be delivered uh, by the end of this uh, calendar year. So it's, it's been a, a, a successful capital project. And, uh, and, it, and it's a demonstrated technology through uh, Savannah River and Fukushima. So we're pretty confident in that. Great, and actually for all the uh, folks here, the agency folks that have spoken, it's helpful and a, a good reminder to our viewing audience that projects may be underway for years. And so when we talk about what's the priority or what are you really focusing on this year, it still may be a piece of a much larger project. And, and so hitting some really key places there. So thank you for reminding us all about that. Susan, what would, what would the HAB say would be the things that, or the thing that is really on their radar for this year? We're really excited about the plutonium finishing plant coming down slab on grade. We've been following that project for m most of the 25 years that the board has been in existence. So that's really exciting. We're hopeful that there will be characterization under it. And uh, as Joe talked about, the contamination surrounding that building is, um, has to be dealt with yet. Also, those two projects are getting away from the river, the 324 building as well as the K Basin Sludge Project. Those are very near the river and our job, protect the Columbia River, that's, that's the lens that the board looks through each decision. So I, those two projects and of course tank waste, I mean, I'm repeating what everybody said, but those are issues that we've been following for a long time and we look to see great progress on all of them in the coming year. Great, thank you all very much. Um, I have a couple uh, technical issues to address and it wouldn't be a live stream or anything that involves technology if, if I didn't get an opportunity to say something about this. So we have a couple of things that are going on. Um, if you are using Chrome as a browser, it may be that the question window is not uh, showing up for you. So if that is the case, or even if it isn't the case, please do remember uh, that you can send your questions into hanfordlive at rl.gov. 
So Hanford Live, all one, uh, those two words put together at rl.gov. Um, and, and secondly, related to this, if you're unable to type your full question uh, into that question box because of the character limit, then please use Hanford RL, uh, or Hanford Live at rl.gov uh, to be able to get us that um, little bit longer question. So those are two things that I wanted to be sure to mention to you. All right, so let's go to um, a second question that's around cleanup. Uh, this one is from Philip Kulin, and his question, has DOE ever selected cleanup goals or options for Hanford that exceed the legal requirements? His example, uh, cleanup to drinking water standards when groundwater or surface water standards would have been legally suitable. So since this is directed first to DOE, Brian, would you like an right, opportunity? Joe, would you take that one? Sure. Um, <coughs> DOE follows a process that, um, you know, for, for all of our cleanups, we go through, a, the, we mentioned the Comprehensive Environmental Response and Compensation Liability Act, the CERCLA process. And when we go through that process, we define uh, what our cleanup uh, activities are going to be, what our, our, our alternatives are going to be, and then we select an alternative for the cleanup. And we also come up with levels of uh, what the cleanup levels are going to be for the area that is um, then remediated, uh, whether it's soil or a contaminated building that we demolish. And so we follow the rules and regulations that we in place in what we call the record of decision, so a rod. Once a rod is established, we then follow that becomes our driving mechanism and regulatory document that we go and implement uh, for those. So we implement all of that in there. Um, we intend to implement all of the requirements that we have on the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and all of those things are coordinated with both regulatory agencies as we uh, process that uh, document. And it also becomes a, an open for public comment. And so it goes through that process as well. So those are our cleanup standards that we established. For. Okay, thank you for that, Joe. And looking to uh, Dave or Alex, do you have, from your regulator perspective, because you certainly have a role uh, in thinking about those legal requirements, do you have any comment? Yeah, I, I would like to. So I guess the short answer is is no, because as, as we, we, we haven't. Because as Joe said, we go through a process of identifying you know, what is the release, what has to be addressed, and, and what are the, the standards it has to be cleaned up to to, to meet that given the situation. Um, and so that then, that, the, that requirements analysis gets put into the public documents for comment and then ends up in the record of decision. And that record of decision is the legally required standards so that is what we end up using for for setting standards it, the one example is the you know the water quality standard for hexavalent chrome across the river it's actually the surface water quality standard that we're looking at not the drinking water standard so it's it's what's appropriate for the decision great thank you dave Alex, did you want any uh, to add anything to that? No, I think it, Dave captured that it, it's it's not a, a simple e question to answer when it comes to the circle process, just because of how it's designed and, and how you analyze the specific site and how you establish cleanup levels and how you analyze a, a variety of alternatives that will actually meet the legal requirements. So um, it's not a super simple answer to que uh, question to answer. Okay, well, thank you all for, for uh, trying to answer it. And I'm reminded here by one of the folks that submitted a comment that to the understanding that Hanford is very technical and it's very complicated, to the extent that you can uh, resist acronyms and say anything in as plain speak as possible, uh, the audience will certainly appreciate that. And I think it's uh, terrific that we have people that are a um, little less familiar with Hanford and uh, just need a little help with that. So again, I understand how difficult uh, this subject is from a technical standpoint, but anything you can do to help would be very much appreciated. All right, let's have another uh, question around, this is around cleanup progress. This is from Sharon Montero. Uh, her question, and this, I'm gonna direct it to you, Alex, because it was actually a follow-up, I think, from the slide that you had. Um, and it's related to the cesium and strontium capsules. Her question, how long are the radioactive cesium and strontium capsules expected to stay at Hanford? Mm. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I, we don't know yet. 
how long they're going to stay at Hanford. Technically, they are high-level radioactive waste that should go to a deep geologic repository for final disposal. Um, the hard part is the country doesn't have a deep geologic repository yet. It was supposed to be Yucca Mountain, and it has gone through a series of delays and is now sort of in a, a holding pattern. So uh, I think what we're trying to do is just get them into interim safe storage here on the Hanford site until we know what that final disposition will be. Okay, thank you. Um, DOE, did you have anything to add to any of that? No? Well, it captures very well. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> All right, another question around cleanup progress. Uh, and this goes to the photos that you had, Brian, of um, the aerial photos, the before and after. So we think that the question is around, is the area around the reactors after cleanup uh, and, and if waste was buried there. So the question is, thanks for the aerial pictures of before and after, but how much of the waste is just buried? Joe, you wanna to talk to that? I think it's a river corridor question. Well, it's a, it's a question that's kind of similar to the one we just answered on the record of decision on the rod. So as we went through all of those sites and you saw in the picture that there was a different color of the soils that you looked around from uh, as you looked at the aerial, those are uh, waste sites where we went and dug up uh, and removed the contaminants. So as we were digging the soils up, there were certain points in our, in our uh, remediation uh, process where we took samples to make sure that we met the cleanup standards. During that time, um, there's uh, an opportunity for our regulators to also take split samples and verify that we had completed our cleanup. If those samples would come back and still show an elevated level there that still didn't not meet, the, we would continue to uh, do the remediation. So we continued and did all of those remediations and completed those. If we, there is a process where we still go and do some uh, work where we have the pump and treat systems. Uh, if we see that we, or detect that there's some contaminate sites, we have a process where we would go back and, and do some further remediation. And we do a five-year circle of review, uh, comprehensive environmental response uh, compensation and liability act. So we follow that five-year process. For okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, Dave, looks like you'd like to speak to this. Yeah, I would like to add just a little bit. I, I guess very little is is left behind unless it was it it was deep so it's not easily accessible or both from a uh, primarily from a, a surface uh, someone being exposed and also that if we did leave something deep it wouldn't affect groundwater um, so so that was one of the goals of the river quarter cleanup is move it away, pull it out, keep, take it to Erdiff. So, so the department has removed a lot to, to ensure that there wasn't l that much left behind. Most of the areas available for unlimited surface use, so. Okay, yes. Dave mentioned Erdiff, which is, uh, it's the environmental restoration and disposal facility. It's a giant landfill where a lot of the waste from the river corridor cleanup was taken. So, you know, some of the waste is technically quote unquote buried, but it's buried in an engineered landfill with um, liners and um, all sorts of systems to make sure the waste doesn't eventually make it to groundwater. Okay, great. Thank you all for contributing to that. And, and I know that the river corridor cleanup and reactors have been an issue for the Hanford Advisory Board in the past. I don't know if you have any perspective you want to share with that or it's beyond acknowledging that that continues to be a, yeah. an issue for you. Right. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, this is a question now jumping uh, in, a little bit ahead, uh, maybe future-wise, land management post cleanup. So this is an anonymous uh, question that we received. How will Hanford land be used when cleanup is finished? So I'm gonna go to DOE first, Brian. Um, yeah, there, there is a comprehensive land use plan that has been done that lays out future land uses across the site um, as you rightly point out, it is very far into the future at this point, um, but we work towards that plan. Um, it is a governing document for how we think about the longer term cleanup effort. Um, and I think it's been very useful to ensure that we have those conversations about what are the standards to which we're cleaning up, what are the objectives of the overall cleanup program over time um, as we look to the future. 
there'll be a periodic review of the comprehensive land use plan. Um, I think it was, Joe, Joe Harp probably has a lot more background on it than I do, but I think it was approved in about 2012. Um, we haven't gone back and reviewed it since, but there'll be a point as we continue the cleanup that it would naturally make sense for us to go back and, and take a fresh look at the comprehensive land use plan, but that really becomes the, the overarching document. Joe, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, uh, just that it, it, uh, the whole process for that to establish the comprehensive land use plan went through an environmental impact statement uh, process, and uh, that, that was all uh, laid out. And so we have a map that kind of shows and lays out all the different uh, processes that, or uh, what the facility, the land use for each of the sections of the facility would be laid out for. And then we utilize that for our de decision and to input into this, um, the records of decision that we were developing. Okay. Uh, other agencies, regulators, have any comment on the land use plan? Any of that? No, I think all the parties recognize, and I think the environmental documents re recognize this as well, that a, per a portion of the site will probably never be used for recreational purposes or people to just y just come onto the site and use it because they some of the worst stuff will remain on site and be disposed of. And I think we're all trying to shrink the area that that um, where that waste is. So. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on? Yes, Susan. The advisory board has talked about end states um, several times uh, because we're really not because decision cleanup decisions made now will affect the end state and it really hasn't been defined totally yet because it is so far in the future. So we're simply hopeful that we get the best cleanup possible safely done and um, several board members have different ideas of how the land ought to be used and and this discussion will go on and on until that finally is reached and like any other document that was written so far in to address things so far in the future the comprehensive land use plan will be changed and adjusted as cleanup decisions are made and as cleanups happen and so we're actively engaged in in talking about decisions that are made today that will affect how the land could be used in the future although because we are an environmental management board we don't get engaged in as far as you should use the land this way we don't actually do that we only comment and provide advice on actual cleanup actions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I have a, a follow-up question for Joe, if I might just go directly to Joe. You used the term split sample uh, a little bit ago, and I think it was when you were talking about the, uh, the cleanup of the waste sites. Can you just quickly define what you mean when you say split sample? What I meant by split sample is when you have a dig site where you've gone and, and it's a large removal, uh, normally what you do is you go down and you grab a, let's say it's a soil, so you grab some soil that you're going to send off to a laboratory to do some analysis and make sure that the contaminant, uh, they tell us what the contaminants. We give a sample, would be taken and provided to the regulatory agencies or they would have somebody that would actually go and take the sample and then we would take our sample and they send it to their lab and we send it to our lab and then we get different, re we get the results and then we compare the results and make sure that um, it's, it's an independent verification of, of what we've done with cleanup. Great. Thank you for uh, clarifying that for us. All right. Um, so still on, on cleanup sorts of topics, which uh, actually would probably be kind of intuitive once we're talking about Hanford, right? It is about cleanup. Uh, but uh, as, as this will not surprise you, a couple of questions about uh, the Columbia River cleanup. So I'm going to go to the first question that uh, talks about chromium and strontium just because we've had those words said tonight already. So let's, uh, let's go to those, um, to those items. What research exists on how far chromium and strontium have migrated down the Columbia River from Hanford? Can any of you speak to that? Well, I, I mean, I do know that that your the department someone has mentioned I think the the Battelle Pacific Northwest Labs does a an annual environmental monitoring report that looks at 
everything site-wide. And I know in the past they have gone back and looked at the river and river cores and I don't know the results of that, but I know that it has been done. And I can talk a little bit about that if, yes, if we're good to go. Uh, so back in 2006 time frame, we, as we were starting the cleanup along the Columbia River and doing the river corridor, um, there was a, uh, an effort to put, that, to put in on the document what was uh, the baseline that we had along the Columbia River. So we did a thing called the River Corridor Baseline Risk Assessment. That River Corridor Baseline Risk Assessment went around and took all, a lot of samples around the Hanford site and then, uh, and then north upstream of the river and also downstream behind some of the dams. We did some coring samples and so a lot of the documentation of all of the results of that were captured through that document that's called the River Corridor Baseline Risk Assessment. And then that set the baseline for us to then start and make sure that our cleanup uh, was actually progressing and we, then we had something that we could compare to as we uh, started doing all of our cleanup along the Columbia River. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add to that? All right, thank you for, for helping to clarify that. Uh, so again, another question about the Columbia River here. Um, can you tell us how much, uh, in simple terms, can you tell us how much Hanford, pardon me, in simple terms, emits harmful waste per year into the Columbia River? So how much waste does Hanford contribute to the Columbia River in if, each year, and if there's any way to express that in a, a way that, that people could relate to, that would be helpful. Process. Yeah. So um, in s simple terms, let me see. Hmm. Yeah. <coughs> the Hanford site is simple. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, no, I think that a very good question because sometimes we get really engulfed in the details of, and then it becomes a very highly technical uh, uh, answer. Uh, in short term, there is that we do monitor. We have a very comprehensive uh, monitoring plan that our monitoring system uh, along the Columbia River, and we we have a uh, Hanford annual site uh, report that uh, puts out all of the data that we collect along the, the, the river and some of the uh, surface uh, area. The amount of uh, the last report um, showed that we had uh, a level of 0 0.071 millirem, if I remember that data correct, um, that was actually going into the river. And that compared to uh, what you get per year uh, we get uh, 360 millirem per year on just from the sun and being outside uh, and, and those kinds of activities. So this was at 0 0.071, uh, and it's mainly from uh, some of the surface uh, uranium that we have uh, on our site. Uh, but, you know, that again is compared to the baseline that we take along that. So it's very, very low. Uh, it's an order of mag uh, several orders of magnitude below uh, just a normal that we get the sample above uh, on the river. It's like at four millirem from from that. So, and, and millirem is a commonly used radiological um, uh, uh, measurement. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, ecology, EPA. Do you have anything you want to add to uh, your perspective of what Hanford is contributing to uh, the co uh, contamination at Columbia River? Not, I don't. Okay. The only message is we haven't eliminated completely the chemical contamination that goes through the river, um, but it is when it hits the river, it is below drinking water standards. So it's not stopped entirely, but when it hits the river, it is below drinking water standards. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add. Oh, sure. The pump and treat program is still continuing. We treated 2 billion gallons, 2.4, 2.5 billion gallons last year. And as you saw in the presentation, the plumes are continuing to shrink. Uh, we have thousands of monitoring wells across the site to maintain very clear picture, not only internal to the site, but uh, at the, along the river as well. Um, and we, we are actively managing um, where those wells are placed where those um, new wells might be placed to continue the pump and treat to increase the effectiveness. And the progress over the last eight or nine years, which you saw on the screen, 
we're, we're going to continue to work to continue to make progress and continue to reduce the risk of contaminants getting to the river. I think uh, the program has been very, very effective, um, very successful. It's a cornerstone of the Richland Operations Office, and it will continue to be that for the for foreseeable future. Thank you. And I actually have a question, I think, that really flows nicely from uh, that answer that you just provided or that response. How often is the groundwater and other water tested for contamination? Literally almost continuous. continuous. Yeah. And we have a very good representation of the understanding of the geology of the site. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's part of what I think we've done well and will continue to do well is focus on continuing to shrink those plumes, continue to reduce the risk to the river, continue to move um, our groundwater program where it needs to be placed to maximize the efficiency of the process. Great. And Dave, I know, um, or at least I believe I re recall that EPA is very involved in the pump and treats and, and monitors that, is very interested in that. Anything to add to what Brian said? No, he's, he, he, he got it just right. That we're, there's a, a lot of work being done. It's very important to, to everybody up here. Um, and so I think he, he said it just perfectly. Excellent. Okay, so I still have a number of questions, but I'm going to invite again uh, for folks that are watching this and maybe have a question that's coming up to mind. Um, please be sure and get that submitted. We definitely want an opportunity to bring it to the panel tonight. Uh, so either use the question box with its um, limited characters, but still a sentence or two uh, for sure you could get in there. Um, in the live streaming and also Hanford Live at rl.gov. Please do continue to send those questions in. And we're actually going to do a quick little swing back to that land management discussion we had just a moment ago. We had a question that came in, and I don't want you to forget where you left off. So uh, this is from Liz Matson. Uh, her question, can you give some examples of future land use that is imagined and how that impacts the way cleanup is planned and executed? So that's a good Richland operations question? Yep, I guess so. Um, back to looking at the comprehensive land use plan. Uh, if you take, for example, the uh, 300 area, um, that's an industrial use um, s segment for our cleanup, uh, kind of what we call brownfield. And what that means is uh, we'll have it cleaned up and, and restored the, the area, and it will be ready for um, any kind of facilities to be built there not for residential, but more for industrial use. And, um, you know, plans could be either for uh, us to be able to transfer those lands or, or uh, right now, like uh, the science office, if they have a continued mission and they need those lands, they could use them, but it would be under an industrial use uh, type uh, setup. Thank you. Any, any other panelists wish to speak to that? Alex? The question was, um, how does that drive some of the cleanup decisions? And it really comes down to, you know, I think the future land use drive, tends to drive cleanup, um, uh, the cleanup levels you ultimately use because you, you need to assume what the exposure risk is to whoever is going to be using it. And so I think like the most restrictive is a, is a residential use standard where you assume people will be in the dirt gardening or children may get it in their mouths or whatever. And so um, it really does, as Susan was alluding to in her remarks, it really does help drive the, the cleanup levels that you ultimately use. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And uh, I'll keep you posted if we have more land management questions that come our way. Um, so just so that you can anticipate with excitement, we have some around cost, we have some around operations of the site. I'm going to turn now to uh, tank waste, and there's also some related, you know, Joe's like, hey, thank you, give me, <laughs> I've been answered some questions. Um, so we'll go to tank waste, and there are some, I think, that are related to the waste treatment plant. So hopefully I will get these in the right kind of order. Um, so here, let's see. Uh, Here's a question from Leonard uh, Peterson, and his question, and this is about the waste treatment plant consent decree milestone challenges. What are the biggest contributors to the serious concerns over meeting the 2033 and 2036 dates for cleaning up high-level waste? wastes? Pardon me. Well, do you want me to say that again? Because I kind of stumbled. What are the biggest contributors to the serious concerns over meeting the 2033 and 2036 dates for cleaning up high-level wastes? So 
We uh, stopped construction of pretreatment high-level waste in 2012 based on technical issues. And there were several technical issues that were brought about when we had the an external group of experts come in and take a look at, at the design. Um, from that point on, we've been resolving those technical issues and we've got to the point where we have said that we have completed the, the resolution of them, but that resolution is kind of the scientific part of the resolution. That's not the design of redesign and we think that there may be some aspects of that redesign that are going to bring up some more issues that we're going to have to resolve. In addition, we had some cost growth on the low activity waste facility and we're projecting uh, cost growth in pretreatment high level waste. And um, with budget um, realities, um, we had to factor that in and there, we, we don't think we're going to have the budget to be able to do high level waste and pretreatment at this point at the same time. So what we did is we entered into what we call an analysis of alternatives. So when we have cost growth per our um, Department of Energy DOE orders, we go back and take a look um, at the alternative that we had selected. So we're going back and reaffirming um, our path forward for the pretreatment high level waste and looking at other options. So, um, and we're going through that process right now. And um, we did issue serious risk notice to the state on um, the high level waste mission. And we're in discussions with the state on that right now, but we are looking at alternatives. Okay, I'm gonna have a follow up question for you in just a moment, but Alex, I wanted to come to you uh, to get your perspective on that, on these, that question. Uh, I think, um, you know, we, we have to rely on the Department of Energy to let us know what the risks are or what the causes are of the serious risk to meeting the deadlines. But I think from what we understand, it's, it's definitely there's technical challenges and there's funding challenges. And so, um, so, yeah, we're engaging in discussions with them and we'll see where this all goes. Okay. Uh, let me do a follow-up for you, Ben, on this, and then if, if there are others that wish to comment on this. And, and I think you partly got to this in your, in your answer. So this question is, is an anonymous question. What is the decision or strategic approach on funding and building high-level waste treatment facility at the waste treatment plant? So I think you touched on part of that, but it, do you have anything else to say about the decision or strategic approach to that going forward? Sure, so we, we did resolve the technical issues on high level waste. Um, Congress has appropriated funds um, the last couple of years and we're in a continuing resolution. So we do have some funds for high level waste right now. We are um, continuing the design of high level waste because the alternatives we're looking at all include the high level waste facility. So um, we're trying to incorporate those technical issue resolutions into the design and move that forward as we go through that alternative analysis. Okay, thank you. Any comment on that, Alex? No? Okay. I'm sure, Brian. One of the key elements here is to recognize that we, we declared that the serious risk may exist as to, to be true to the perspective that we want to be open, collaborative, transparent um, with ecology, with EPA, and communicate when we see challenges in future parts of the mission, um, the department remains committed to the high level waste treatment mission just as it is committed to the low activity waste treatment mission. I think we have an obligation to continue that work and we will. Um, but when you talk about strategy and we talk about where we're going overall, we're trying to find ways to deliver the high level waste mission at a, a risk level that we have more control over in an in incremental way so that we can control our risk and deliver progress while we learn and we proceed. Many of those projects at the Hanford site are one of a kind and first of a kind, which represent unique challenges. And, and so if we can find a way like we did with tank side seizing removal um, to uh, approach it from a, a more incremental, a crawl, walk, run type approach, manage our risks better, manage our costs better, um, and, and start the treatment, we'll learn from that and we'll continue to grow from that. I think the high level waste mission represents the same challenge. Um, and because of where we were in the 
build, process, and focus on direct feedlot activity waste, it was appropriate and prudent to take the approach we did with the high-level waste mission. And we'll continue to engage the ecology as we have over the last, more than the last year, um, to have those conversations together. I, we recognize that doesn't mean ecology is endorsing the approach, but it's important to us to make sure that ecology is a part of the process, and we continue to com stay committed to that. Okay, thank you, Brian. Anything to add to that, Alex? Just, um, you know, we, we hear what the department is saying on this. I think it's, um, there's just a long history with the waste treatment plant facilities and, um, and the history of when we were all supposed to be making glass, um, you know, high level waste glass logs. Um, and I think it's just challenging for the state to feel as though we're, you know, kind of going back to the drawing board on some of these things when we've done that so many times already. But um, we are talking with the department. I did want to, you know, just uh, clarify the analysis of alternatives uh, process that Ben was mentioning is really a Department of Energy initiative, and it's something that we are able to sit in and observe their process. Um, but it really is a department-centered and department-driven process, and so we're awaiting the outcome of that along with the Department of Energy. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the clarification of that. And I'm so glad that you mentioned glass logs because I feel like it's related to this word that is in my next question, so I'm always looking for the threads. Uh, this has this... Whoever gets to answer this question, I'm guessing it is going to be in the uh, Brian Ben uh, realm. Um, you'll you'll want to make this, uh, simplify this. Why vitrify tank waste if it could be packaged as transuranic waste and sent to the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico? So there's a bunch of stuff around that that if people aren't familiar, they're, they're not necessarily gonna get. So can you help us by just putting a little context around that as you're answering that question? So um, there's a, a process that we go through called waste incidental to reprocessing where you make a, a determination of the, the type of waste it is. We have up to 13 tanks that we call, that we believe could be contact handled true. Um, and we've gone through that process. We haven't finalized the determination that that is true waste, but there's all, also permitting changes that would have to be done at WIP um, to accept tank waste. So we believe that um, those 13 tanks at some point could be processed as true waste and, and sent to WIP. And we've looked at that in the past. It's just, it's a matter of when you can do that, you need the funding to be able to do that. So it kind of is uh, not finalized in time when we're going to do that because we're focused on the A and AX retrieval to this time. And transuranic waste for somebody who doesn't know what that is, and I, it's kind of complicated, but when you say true waste, you mean transuranic waste. Transuranic waste. waste. And, and is there any way just to kind of simply say what, what that's different from? I'd say it's the elements above uranium on the <laughs> periodic table. Well, that is helpful. Um, I'm reminded that I didn't do so well in, uh, in, in any of that. So um, thank you for that. And contact handled, what does that mean? Um, there's remote handled and contact handled. It's lower in, in uh, the uh, dose rate to, so you can actually contact it. You can, it's contact handled. It doesn't have to be remotely handled with other equipment. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, does anyone else want to speak to that? Brian or Alex, anything from a tank waste perspective? No, I'll, I'll hold that off. I'll okay. hold my thought. Well, you get your own very special question, uh, and it is uh, related, or at least it says it's related to tank waste, so I'm going to take it at its, at its word. This is from Frederick Brim. What is the status, and it's specifically about ecology permitting, what is the status of the permafix request to ecology for regulatory permission to process Hanford tank waste? Mm -hmm. So that was related to a specific project, um, the test bed initiative. And uh, they, we did, they did a treatability test at the Permafix of three gallons of Hanford tank waste and tried to, um, the test was just to see if they could grout it and use that as the treatment form, grout instead of glass, and then send it to a disposal facility that would accept it, which is, um, there's a, a commercial disposal facility in Texas called Waste Control Specialists, and so they sent it there. 
Um, they then had a proposal um, to do, I think it was 2,000 gallons, and so we were working on the permit for that with the Department of Energy, and um, uh, the department chose not to pursue it uh, to completion. So, uh, you know, Permafix, we're in the process of working with them to renew their permit. Um, they are a, a mixed waste facility that under Ricker we also regulate. Um, and so we're still working through that permitting renewal. And I think once we're completed that, there'll be some additional provisions that'll allow them to do some other proce waste processing. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to that at all? Uh, I have a related question, at least, again, I think it's related, and it's about grout, um, since you mentioned it. Uh, why has there been so much attention given to the use of grout uh, concrete, I guess, uh, in recent years? Mm. Well, I'll give you the state's um, perspective on that. Uh, grout is an alternative way to encapsulate um, mixed waste, and it, it theoretically holds on to the chemicals. and and the radioactivity um, and doesn't allow it to escape into the environment. Uh, I think the concern the state has with using grout at Hanford, uh, specifically when it comes to tank waste, uh, is that uh, the environmental studies we've seen show it does not, the grout does not hold on to the waste long enough that eventually that waste will, the grout will break down because it is permeable, because uh, it's concrete, and eventually that waste will make it down to the groundwater and then eventually the Columbia River. So we've got concerns about how grout could be used at Hanford, especially if we're talking about tank waste. But for other wastes um, at Hanford, grout is used often. Okay. Any comment by DOE on that, on grout? We, we've invested a lot in grout because we, we use it in three different cases. The first case is we, after we uh, finish retrieving a tank, what we think we're going to do is fill those tanks up with a, a grout formulation. So that's one form of grout that we're going to use. The second is what we call secondary waste. So those waste, um, we get a lot of, we generate a lot of secondary waste, be it filters and other um, materials within the waste treatment plant that we have to get rid of in the landfill. So we, we envision using a grout process for those secondary waste. And the third is, um, in addition to the waste treatment plant, low activity waste, um, if you look at our system planning or our life cycle, we, we have to have additional capacity for the low activity waste. And so we're looking at other waste forms. And so we've invested in the grout to see if, if that is going to be an acceptable waste form. And Congress has taken an interest in that too. Um, we just had the National Academy of Science do a, a full study on what the best way of, of that supplemental treatment is going to be. And, and they have some recommendations in there about grout. And, and Alex, you mentioned uh, grout being permeable or a little more permeable. And in the question, uh, there was concrete by grout. And when I think of grout, and many viewers may think of grout as something they put when they're tiling their floor. So can you just, just again, to help people picture this, when you say grout, what, what would that look like? What would that mean? I would more like the concrete versus the grout in your floor. I'm actually comforted that it wouldn't look like the grout in my floor. That's probably wouldn't, wouldn't do it. All right. Um, so I have a couple follow-up questions on cleanup, and then we'll go back uh, and, and hit some other ones. Again, uh, for the folks that are viewing this, um, really appreciate your submitting your questions, HanfordLive at rl.gov. Uh, and also the question box in the uh, live stream that you have. So this is a question about air. Uh, and the question, it, this was an anonymous question, is radiation being released into the air and is it monitored? And I, I, I'm thinking that's an EPA or is, no, no, Alex, huh? Well, no, actually, uh, the state doesn't regulate, the Department of Ecology doesn't regulate radioactive materials. Um, and when it comes to air emissions on site, the department, I believe, um, regulates those. When it comes to air emissions of radioactivity outside the fence line, say if something were to migrate outside the fence, then it's actually the State Department of Health that uh, regulates that. So, okay. so I'll, I defer to the department on this right. question. Um, well, I, I think you know we, we, there is a very robust, um, and, and it really steps back to the planning process for 
all the work we do at the Hanford site. Um, there's a very rigorous and structured planning process which considers the hazards um, in the soils, in the equipment, in the facilities, and also the potential that the work we do could create contamination that could be spread by, by air. Um, whenever we do work, um, and plutonium finishing plant is a very good example of that, um, there's a, a tremendous amount of fixative, which you can think of as glue, that's placed on the facility during the demolition process to fix the contamination, control the contamination during the process where the demolition is occurring so it doesn't become airborne. And we've gotten very sophisticated in response to some of the issues we had at the plutonium finishing plant um, a few years ago relative to um, when work can be conducted with respect to wind speeds, when work can be conducted with respect to um, the amount of how the, how the um, fixative is placed, um, how much rubble can be on the ground at any one time to make sure we're con controlling contamination throughout. And there's a robust sampling process around the work that's being done to ensure that we're continuously monitoring whether there is airborne uh, activity being produced and to ensure that we take appropriate actions when we find it. And so um, beyond that, there's also sites, lo locations around the entire site that are being monitored as well um, continuously. And, and I think we sample, uh, Joe, I think it's 100 sites across the site. Yeah. So, so there is a very robust process that we use to control the contamination while we're doing work sample while we're doing the work and continue to monitor across the site to ensure that the contamination that, that might be produced and does go airborne um, doesn't travel beyond the boundaries that we established for the work to be done. Okay. Thanks, Brian. I'm, I'm going to look to you, Susan, just, I, I know, <laughs> only because uh, you've mentioned the plutonium finishing plant a couple of times and just wondering, is the issue about air, uh, is that an issue that has come to the board? Before, is that anything that's uh, of a significant uh, concern, this question around uh, how air is being monitored and radiation releases? We certainly have discussed that in um, the HSEP, the Hanford Friends Emergency Preparedness. We have five subcommittees on the HAB, and we have actually talked about that. And um, as far as worker safety, public safety, that sort of thing, the board has looked at the processes in place to ensure that there would be engagement with the public if that should happen. Um, and we do have uh, people stop in and talk about air admissions and that sort of thing occasionally. So the board has looked at it, but from an overall perspective. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, so, Joe, you might have thought you were off the hook because we were talking uh, waste treatment plant and tank waste, but there's a follow-up for you. Uh, so this is concerning possible contamination of the river. The question is, you've talked to us about the levels of radioactivity entering the river. Are you also able to discuss the possible chemical contamination entering the river? Yep, and as Brian had alluded to, um, and we had it here is, there are other contaminants, uh, chemical contaminants that we still have that are along, and that's why along the river, that's why we still have the pump and treat. One is chromium. Uh, but as, as we continue to uh, monitor and uh, really implement some rigorous uh, uh, direct um, um, treatment, or, or um, I would say kind of, uh, the treatment facility the plan right now is like a flushing of some areas. I'm thinking about K area. Um, so for the chromium piece, uh, we do monitor that. Uh, we do have the pump and treat systems that provide that uh, um, contaminant and we run it through the system. But we've also been working with uh, e uh, EPA on, uh, for example, at the K area where we, the groundwater there uh, actually re was below drinking water standards. And so we ended up uh, had the uh, capability of shutting the system down. Our monitoring system stayed up, but the actual treatment phase was able to be shut down. We shut that down, but we were monitoring it. We saw some levels starting to come back up, so we started the system back up, and uh, we, none of it got into the river. And so we, we started that process, and with EPA's help, we saw that, hey, this, this uh, chromium's taking so long, uh, and it's kind of dispersed throughout, it's very difficult for us to go and just try to clean it up. So. We've started a feasibility study where we're um, soaking the ground with some water, flushing it into the system so that we can get it out sooner. 
and that's working out really well, and we're controlling that very well. And so chromium S1, we have iodine as another uh, contaminant of concern. Carbon tetrachloride is another one. And so we're working through all, all of those and monitoring them with our groundwater system. Okay, thank you. Uh, state or federal regulators, any comment on that or any uh, additional perspective? Nope. nope. Okay. Uh, let's get to a couple cost questions because a number of you have mentioned um, we might do this and the costs are really high. I, I know, uh, Ben, you mentioned a couple of, of these as being a bit of an issue. So have some questions. Uh, let's see. Let's go to this one. This is Tallis Johnson. None of these meetings uh, answered the question of cost. The cost of what is being achieved at Hanford over the last 20 plus years is much too high. Can any of the DOE panelists uh, defend such cost and such burdens to the average taxpayer? I think that would be mine to answer. Um, I think what we have to recognize is the Hanford cleanup is challenging. Um, it is, the national security mission was, went on for 45 years as I talked about earlier um, the environmental standards and, and the environmental protection during the national security mission. Frankly, at the beginning, it was a new science, and there wasn't a lot understood about um, how the, the contaminants would move through the ground or, or be captured by the ground. And so the standards for treatment were much different or, or, or management of those effluents and those chemicals were different. And I don't think in the early days they believed that the site would operate for 45 years after the completion of World War II. And so during that time in national security mission, national security was a priority um, and, and cleanup or, or environmental um, protection became more a part of the, the, the work at Hanford, but it, it was slow and it was later and it was typically a much lower priority. So today, when we go and do the cleanup work that we have to do, we're talking about very highly contaminated facilities um, many of the approaches we have to take are first of a kind, sometimes one of a kind, um, with workers in multiple layers of protection, protective equipment, sometimes on forced air. Um, we do a lot of the work um, that we're doing now um, after we put mock-ups in place so we can practice in a clean environment. Uh, we were able to use a mock-up very effectively with the sludge treatment project. Um, we have a mock-up for the 324 building facility. I know some of the work that was done at PFP was also done with clean fill to practice before that team went in and did remediation. And though we believe the site is well characterized, some of the facilities are very old. Um, we had the Purex tunnel event just a couple of years ago that caused us to take a fresh look across the site. And we have, um, as Dave mentioned, some cribs and vaults uh, in the vicinity of the plutonium finishing plant that we also have to go and stabilize um, probably with the grout at the right time to, to reduce the risk so we can continue the cleanup. So it took a long time to put the Hanford site into the condition that it was, was in 1989 when we started the cleanup. It's gonna take a long time to clean up. I think, however, if you look at the amount of work that's been done safely, effectively, and efficiently, as I showed in the pictures at the beginning, um, that's 900 facilities demolished. Over 1,300 waste sites remediated. We still, we still have more to do. Um, we find sometimes challenges. The 324 building was on its way to demolition when the contamination below the facility was found, and then it had to be characterized and the work replanned, um, the building stabilized. And frankly, I was the 324 project manager when I was a contractor for a while. Um, the B cell, which was the main cell inside the building, the equip equipment had been dumped in there to prepare to demolish the facility, and part of the cost of the project now is to pull it all back out to get access to the floor, to cut the floor, to get to the soil, to remediate the soil so then we could put the facility in, in a condition where we can demolish it um, safely using open air techniques. So it's a very complicated cleanup effort. Many of the times the work we're doing is first of a kind and one of a kind, and so the department is committed to continue to make progress, continue to use every dollar we receive from Congress wisely, continue to work with our regulators um, and, and create the conditions to, to keep the progress moving. Um, we have years to go. Dedicated professional team should be very proud of what they've accomplished, um, but it costs real money to get the work done, and I can't explain it any more simply than that. Okay, thank you. 
Um, regulators, do you have any perspective on costs that you would want to share? One number that we've uh, looked at that I, th I think helps us kind of try to keep it in perspective is if you look at the cost of the nuclear weapons complex overall, um, over its life, it's $9 trillion. And we're looking at costs for cleanup that are a fraction of that. And so, you know, there's, if you put it sort of in, in perspective, hopefully it doesn't seem to be um, quite as shocking to the conscience. Well, and, and I have a follow-up question or a connected question, I believe. Um, as you mentioned funding, it sounds like there is not enough funding for a proper cleanup. Why is that? Well, I, I think you've got to look at the, the fact that, you know, Hanford receives about $2.5 billion a year, at least it has in the last year or so. Um, that's uh, the EM complex overall receives about $7 billion, and the Department of Energy budget is in the $30 billion range. So the Hanford site is getting a fairly significant portion of the money that goes to the Department of Energy and certainly, certainly to the um, Environmental Management Organization. Um, there is a lot of work left to do at Hanford, and we work very closely with the regulators, at times with Susan and the Hanford Advisory Board, to ensure that we prioritize the work we do um, and we spend the money where we believe it has the most impact from a risk reduction perspective. And we'll continue to, to use every dollar, as I said, as effectively and efficiently as we can, anchored on the fact that we have to conduct this work safely. The safety of the workforce um, is paramount to the work we do every single day. We work very closely with the contractors and with labor to ensure that's the priority that they stay focused on. Um, we will use every dollar we we receive wisely. We will use every dollar to reduce the overall uh, cleanup mission where we can in a prioritized way. Um, and it's very difficult to assume that we're going to get more than the fraction of the federal budget that we get today. So th that, that typically becomes an issue of contention between the regulators and the department. Um, but we'll continue to work with them to make sure that we're working on the right things to protect, the again, the workforce, the public, and the environment. Thank you. Regulators, any perspective to add? I would like to add one thing, and that is I, I want to respond to the, the can't afford to do a proper cleanup. Um, I don't think, I do not believe that that's true. We are always going to do a proper cleanup, but what may have to, to slip is the time. We may not get it done as fast as we want to do, but we'll still get it done properly. Susan, the Hanford Advisory Board, as Brian mentioned, weighs in annually on the budget and priorities and anything to add? We just actually had a, a budget meeting and we had a committee of the whole discussing about priorities and we have no control over how Congress allocates money. But we've understood now that we need to really become educated, understand what is needed in order to move the most critical projects forward and what actions have to take place. So we're working from that perspective, understanding that if they had all the money to do everything, they wouldn't be able to do it all in the, the compressed time frame anyway. You'd have to train people. And, and the fact that this contamination that is here has built up over decades and the rules for cleaning up and taking care of things have matured so that we can keep our workforce safe, so that we can protect the public. So you have layers of dollars that have to be spent in order to get the work done. It's just a matter of fact. And when emerging things happen as the Purex tunnel collapse or, or other things happen or some other national emergency happens, there's only so many dollars. So. It's what, what do we need to do first to keep the cleanup progress moving, and the board understands that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, uh, circling back, we are, um, surprisingly, the time is just flying for me. I don't know about you guys sitting there answering the questions. So we have uh, about uh, seven more minutes before we go into the opportunity for some closing remarks from, from each of you. So I have a couple of questions that are um, just a little bit more technical, I, I, uh, but I, I think this 
I think we'll be able to get there. One of them is on the waste treatment plant, and so Brian, however you would like to direct this question. So the context for this um, is a, a whistleblower complaint uh, that had been made, and the person who had made the complaint, uh, it, it's characterized as his biggest concern is a design flaw that could lead to deadly hydrogen explosion or worse, a nuclear uh, chain reaction. Uh, further, his concern with the prevailing winds that would carry the radiation and contamination eastward, uh, so the areas a couple hundred miles away would be contaminated. So the person who is asking this question is asking, what is the risk of this? Um, what would happen if it occurred? And, and why should I trust your information? Can you speak to that, Brian? Or? I'll have Ben talk to the nuclear safety aspect of it, and then I want to touch on the the, the organizational culture aspect of it related to the whistleblower question. So Ben, if you'll talk about that technical side of it first. All right, so um, the, uh, can you read the first part of it again? Absolutely. I just lost it. Uh, do you want me to reread the whistleblower pieces no, just of it? The so the, the real question is what is the risk of these things happening that the whistleblower um, said would happen? What is the risk of this? What would happen if it occurred? And why should I trust your information, your being DOE's information? And I'm pretty familiar with the, the whistleblower um, concerns, and, and those are related to um, being able to mix tanks within the pretreatment facility. So if, there, if the concern was that if you could not mix the tanks properly, you would settle solids out in the bottom of the tanks and you could have an issue where you accumulate flammable gases that are generated by the um, solids or you could have a criticality event. So as, as part of the resolution, I talked about the external um, review that we had for the technical issues. We brought in experts to take a look at, at the design and um, to, to resolve this, we, we um, used the national labs and all the experts across the United States to resolve the what I, what's referred to as the design flaw and not being able to mix the tanks. And what we did is go through a, a whole process of doing full scale mixing test to prove that we weren't gonna get ourselves in that situation. But in addition to um, the technical aspects of that, we put in layers of controls to ensure that we can prevent or mitigate any um, of those, those concerns and we call it defense in depth. And there's many, many layers of that um, from being able to mix to our ventilation systems if there was a release. So we, we do not have releases to the public or the environment or even the workers. And so we validate that. And like I said, there's many layers to, to make sure that happens. And the concerns of how you should believe us is we bring in technical experts from around the world and from the national labs. And we have the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board that oversees us that um, has raised concerns and we've been able to close those concerns with them also. Thank you, and I know Brian, you wanted to make uh, or comment on this. I have two other questions I really wanna get to, so if we can no, yeah, I'll, be brief. I'll be brief. Uh, I, the, one of the tenets of the nuclear safety culture of the industry and that we've adopted and embraced at the Hanford site is a sense that th we are all um, committed and obligated to raise issues and concerns um, about the safety of any aspect of how we do work, whether it's at the deck plates when people are doing work in the field or in the design process for the site. Um, and we've, you know, I, I, I carry this little book with me every day, Ben and Joe know that. It's called the Safety Culture Focus Areas and Associated Attributes. And we, we start every meeting at the, at, at the DOE organization um, with five or more people with a safety culture topic to reinforce the tenets of transparency, openness, uh, trust, um, and the obligation to listen to each other if we have issues and concerns about how we're doing business, whether it's a issue of today or issue of next year or 10 years from today. Um, in 2011, the Defense Board identified some issues at the Officer of Protection and with Bechtel relative to the safety culture. Since then, we went through a num took a number of actions, including additional contract requirements for our contractors, 
but internally, um, safety culture improvement program, safety culture meetings, things like that, committees. Um, and in 2018, I'm sorry, 2019, um, that, that, that letter, the Defense Board actually closed that issue for the Office of Protection and the Waste Treatment Plant for Bechtel, Bechtel um, Company as well. So that part of the, the, the history of the site perhaps, I think we've, we've taken very seriously and I think it's part of what's making us more successful and successful today. It will help us be successful as we make the transitions into waste treatment plant operations in the future and frankly as an element of the industry that we embrace every single day. And so though I, I, I certainly appreciate the fact that the, the person identified themselves as a whistleblower, I, I, I want to communicate that the culture that may have created the conditions where whistleblowing was necessary or appropriate or, or needed at that time, I believe we've spent a considerable amount of our management attention um, to ensure that for department and our contractors um, that we, we've changed the culture and we're, we're going to listen to people if they have concerns. Thank you, Brian. Uh, anybody need to comment uh, uh, further on that? Okay, then I have, um, I have one technical question that I'm going to lob over to ecology. Get ready. And then I have a general question that I think uh, is, is, will be of great interest to uh, the folks that are uh, with us here tonight. So this is a question to ecology. Please describe Washington State's concerns with uh, USDOE's proposed redefinition of high-level nuclear waste and how concerned members of the public and elected officials can support the state of Washington. Um, unfortunately, that's a complicated topic, so I'll try to uh, be succinct, but um, the basic concern is the, the way high-level waste is defined currently is based on its source. So it's, it's defined as um, uh, the materials from the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel. And that is exactly what's in the tanks at Hanford. It's materials that came from the reprocessing of the uranium fuel rods. Um, they were dissolved in, in giant football field size baths of chemicals. And the plutonium was extracted from that. All the chemical materials with the radioactivity in it was a waste product that was then disposed, disposed of in the tanks. Um, and again, the, the legal definition in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act is um, it's materials from the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel is how high level waste is defined. So um, internationally, they define uh, high-level waste and other uh, grades of waste differently, and they grade it by the radioactivity in the waste. Um, so we don't do that here in the United States. Uh, what the Department of Energy has tried to do uh, with its Federal Register notice is um, give itself for a certain class of waste, um, including potentially uh, things that we would think of as high-level waste at Hanford, it, the discretion to itself call it uh, something other than high-level waste. And again, this is a DOE headquarters initiative. And it would give themselves the discretion to call it something else based on a performance assessment of um, how they plan to treat it and the disposal site where it will be disposed of um, and, uh, and then manage it as something other than high-level waste. And cr the, currently the law requires that high-level waste be turned into glass to make sure that it it, uh, the waste, the treated waste form holds on to both the radionuclides and the chemicals. And then it requires that it be disposed of in a deep geologic repository, like a Yucca Mountain, which again, we don't have. So I think what the department is trying to do is to figure out how to deal with this waste um, and look at ways that waste that um, they don't believe has a high radioactivity content um, in a different way. Um, at Hanford, we're concerned because the current pathway we're on in terms of the waste treatment plant, the pretreatment facility, we're all based on a 1990s process where DOE and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission looked at Hanford's waste and already made that kind of a cut and said, well, uh, the hottest of the hot radioactive waste will treat as high-level waste and will vitrify it, that's 10% of the volume, and 90% of the volume will treat as low-activity waste, and that is what the direct feed low-activity waste facility is being built for, is for that lower activity portion. So for Hanford, we're just concerned because we don't think that kind of a Federal Register notice or reinterpretation is necessary. Um, so that's the primary concern. We also think that the environmental studies to date have shown that from a geological perspective, any waste that will be disposed of at Hanford really needs to be vitrified to make sure that the waste form doesn't break down and eventually reach the Columbia River. So I tried for that to be as 
as pithy as possible. I don't think I succeeded, but um, so those are primary concerns. I think uh, the Federal Register notice is out. Um, it, I think there are some groups that have concerns about it. Uh, the Under Secretary of Energy has committed to the Department of Ecology Director that they will not use it at Hanford or have no plans to use it at Hanford um, in the near future. And so I think we're just waiting to see um, if, in fact, the department does want to use it at Hanford and, and what their proposals might be. All right, thank you. Uh, so that was directed specifically at ecology, but is there any uh, anything that you want to add, Brian, really briefly? I think Alex characterized it well. I, I will say you know, when Under Undersecretary Gabar visited and talked to Maya Bellin, I think it was a good conversation. It, it reaffirmed in a letter that the Undersecretary sent to Maya as well the commitment that, that the department had no immediate plans for application of that, that definition here. And at a point where the department believes it might be prudent or appropriate or haven't pr produced an opportunity to accelerate the cleanup, then we would um, make that proposal and work with the state to determine if that's a way ahead that we agree on mutually. So I think the commitment remains that we will continue to work with the state on that issue um, before we try to apply it. it there's no intention to apply it unilaterally. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, we actually are going to have some leftover questions that we're not going to be able to get to tonight. Um, because we do want to give each of you about a minute to make a closing comment and that's about all we're going to have. Uh, but I will say that there were a couple of questions that were basically around what keeps you up at night, what aspect of cleanup keeps you up at night, and, and your hopes and fears for the legacy of this waste, what are the best and worst case scenarios? So I don't, I don't expect that you'll be able to address those in your closing remarks, but I just wanted to convey to you that there are some folks watching this that really are curious to know um, yeah, what keeps you up at night and what you think uh, the biggest concerns would be. So just ponder that and maybe there'll be a future opportunity and we can explore that a little bit more. Um, before we go to the, uh, the closing comments, uh, I've been asked to just um, announce or, or uh, let folks that are watching know that the presentations that the speakers delivered will be posted at Hanford.gov in the events calendar section of that site. So if you go to the Hanford.gov, you'll see that. Um, and it's, uh, it's on the Hanford Live event page by tomorrow. A video of tonight's live stream, we mentioned that earlier, will be posted by next week on that same page. So if you uh, would really like to get your hands on these um, uh, slides, that you will have an opportunity to do that tomorrow, and the, uh, the video will be uh, next week at some point. Um, so let's go ahead, and Brian, if you don't mind me just starting with you, and, uh, and just give some closing remarks, please. Well, I've certainly appreciated the opportunity to be here tonight and, and provide an overview of the site, answer the questions that, that, that were posed to us. I think it's an important part of our role is to continue to maintain uh, constant communication engagement with the stakeholders, certainly across the Tri-Cities, um, the region, and the nation to make sure that people understand the work we're doing, um, the progress we're making, and the importance of the effort that that we, we certainly um, commit to this effort. Uh, I, would, I would leave you with a sense of optimism. If you, if you look back um, over the first 30 years of the cleanup, the progress here has been tremendous. Not, it's not easy, it's complicated, there's not, is, there's not a day that goes by that we don't have issues um, that are challenges for us associated with the work. Um, but we have a great and, and well and talented workforce managed by very dedicated contractors. Um, we, we're making great progress across the site on numerous fronts, and we are safely uh, reducing the risk uh, to the river and to the region. And so I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about those things, provide our perspective with uh, you know, our partners uh, and associated with the cleanup from the tripartite agency perspective. Um, because that's an important part of our job and it, it sets the conditions around the site for us to make meaningful progress, which is what we're here to do. Great, thank you. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip over uh, Ben and Joe. I'm thinking that you were going to make some closing remarks, and I just want to be sure, just because we're short on time, that we hit, hit the um, other agencies and then we'll, we'll swing back if we have time. Is that fair? Uh, Alex? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I just want to say I appreciate very much everybody's interest in the Hanford site. Um, and as Brian has talked about, there's a lot of progress that we all should celebrate, but there's also a lot of challenges as we move forward. And 
Um, it, to answer the question of what keeps me up at night, uh, honestly, it's funding. Um, I, if we keep the current level of funding going into the future, we won't finish this cleanup until we get into t the 2100s. Um, and we've got facilities and equipment out there managing or holding waste that will be, that are already well past their useful lives and will be very far past their useful lives if we have to um, have the cleanup drag on that long. And so um, I just wanted to encourage those who have an interest um, that Congress people tend to listen to their constituents first and foremost. And so really encourage folks who do care about Hanford cleanup to um, talk to their legislators about it in Congress. Dave? Again, <clears throat> I will echo my thanks to, to, to my colleagues and, and special thanks to you for participating and you're taking your time. Um, please let us know how this worked. Uh, public involvement is important and we, we're, we're looking to, to, to be effective at that. I've, as I've been involved in Hanford Cleanup for over 30 years now and there are challenges. It's not, it is unique. It's, yes, we're doing, implementing the Superfund progress like we would elsewhere, but every place, every site is different. There are challenges there, and that both, that kind of keeps me awake, but that also keeps me energized and keeps, makes it, makes it fun, so. Thank you, Dave. Susan. Closing thoughts? The Hanford Advisory Board commits to continuing to becoming informed, to providing the agencies with well-informed, concise, clear advice and recommendations. Hanford cleanup matters. Stay engaged. Thank you. All right. We are at 9 o'clock, and I want to be sure to uh, make people aware about this uh, evaluation that is online. I realize if you're online, you may not be able to click on that, but if you could just jot it down real quick, we would certainly appreciate that. Um, again, I know Ben and Joe, you were hoping to make a closing comment. If, if it's just like really short, I don't think we can do a full minute. So do you just have any uh, final thoughts that you need to convey? Sure, as, as you said in the opening, I've been here for 28 years, all on the uh, tank waste mission. Um, this is exciting times with the startup of drug feed, low activity waste. Um, I think it's, it's brought some energy to the site. And if you go out there, uh, we had some visitors out there that said there's a lot of activity going on out there. So um, really excited for those times. And this is my second one of these. And with our regional dialogues, we'd like to get some input into um, if, if, and because we're out there trying to spread this good news and, and answer the public's questions. So if they could go to the website and give us an evaluation, that'd be, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Joe, any last? Yeah, just uh, we continue committed to the drive, uh, the safe and effective and efficient cleanup at the Hanford site through the Richland office. We have a lot of great projects that have come to fruition. And uh, all of that is protecting our workforce, the community, and the environment. We're totally committed to that, and we'll continue to do that. All right. Thank you, panelists, very much for your uh, engaged and uh, candid responses tonight. I really appreciate that, and I'm certain that our uh, viewers appreciate that as well. Viewers, thank you so much for submitting uh, thoughtful questions, and we hope that you do continue your engagement and that you respond um, to the evaluation. And also want to thank all of those people who were behind the camera and worked uh, tirelessly to set this up, who were bringing me questions uh, and making sure that uh, I was fully informed about what I was asking. So thanks to all of those folks. Again, thank you to you um, and have a good evening.